Um, so as, as I said, um, as Katie said, I'm the Health and Wellness Coordinator for Garden State Equality. We're the statewide, we're a statewide LGBT advocacy organization here in New Jersey. And I've been hired on, um, I, I started working with Garden State Equality in November of last year and I was hired on to do a lot of LGBT um, health and wellness focused um, training, education, and advocacy. And I'm going to go through some of the, the work that we've been doing since I came on um, with you, and then I'll open it up for questions so that you can have your questions answered. Okay. So I kind of overprepared as if I was going to talk about general LGBT older adult health issues, but we can talk about those in the Q&A section if you like, but I'm just going to start with an overview of Garden State Equality's health and wellness programming. So our first major health and wellness focus project is called Map and Expand, and um, this project was conceived of by one of our former executive directors, um, Andrea Bowen, um, and the the purpose behind this project was to provide a directory of quality healthcare providers for LGBTQ people in New Jersey because we found that um, a lot of people were traveling to Philadelphia and New York um, to, to get um, LGBT clinically competent healthcare providers and we didn't want them to have to do that anymore. We wanted them to be able to go to providers right here in New Jersey. And actually part of this work um, sort of culminated in the opening of the Proud Family Clinic um, at Robert Wood Johnson's Somerset campus um, earlier this year. So we're, we were um, kind of supporting uh, the training initiatives behind that, um, and that's something that I'm very proud of that, that happened um, with the help of Garden State Equality as well as Robert Wood Johnson and a number of other organizations. Um, and in terms of providing this directory, in addition to it, we wanted to provide training and education for healthcare providers who wanted to improve um, their outreach and uh, their services to LGBT consumers. Um, we want to ensure that New Jersey residents no longer have to travel these distances to um, receive quality, um, quality care. And we, you know, we know that there are a lot of people who just have never been able to do that. So we want them to be able to access resources right here in the state of New Jersey. Um, and you can find out more about Map and Expand by going to mapandexpand.com. And Pledge and Protect is kind of our second major area of programming. This is specifically focus on LGBT older adults. Um, and this sort of started out um, when I came on as sort of a letter writing campaign to um, hundreds of older adult care providers throughout the state of New Jersey. Um, we wanted them to sign on to a pledge that we had sort of put together um, um, stating that they would try their best to create an affirming environment for LGBT older adults. and. Um, we basically had sort of a Google spreadsheet where those signatures would populate. And um, when we saw that folks were signing it, we would follow up with them and offer them training, consultations for trainings. Um, and this, um, this project, we've been sort of collaborating with SAGE, which is service, Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders. This is sort of the national advocacy org for LGBT older adult work. Um, as well as Green Hill, which is um, a facility in West Orange. It's an independent facility in West Orange, and they are very supportive and very interested in doing LGBT older adult focused work. Um, and Broadway House has also been a really great um, partner organization. They are the only continuing care facility for um, people living with HIV in the state of New Jersey. So they're definitely another great partner that we've been working with. Um, this project launched in Montclair um, in May, um, and we've been sort of following up with providers, um, um, scheduling trainings, things of that nature. And we hope to have subsequent expansion of this project to other areas of Essex County and ultimately to other areas of the state subsequently. And these are just some sort of sample potential healthcare training topics that we want to provide to. Um, to healthcare providers and organizations. It doesn't just have to be, you know, um, a private practice or a hospital system. It can be like a community-based organization that's, you know, maybe an aid service organization wants to do an in-service um, on, you know, 
LGBT, clinical and cultural competency, something like that, we can offer that. Um, and we can do you know, something that's specific for LGBTQ older adults. And I wanted to kind of highlight the fact that um, the reason why Pledge and Protect was really sort of highlighted as a really important programming area was that you know, a lot of research and data has shown that um, LGBTQ older adults tend to um, go back into the closet when they enter um, certain long-term care facilities, um, or they just tend to be you know, deeply closeted to begin with because they grew up or came up in contexts um, during time periods where um, you know, um, being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender um, was, def was very much pathologized. Um, many may have grown up um, or came up when homosexuality was still you know, considered a psychological disorder. Um, and you know, gender um, uh, transgender identity was only recently removed from um, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of um, Disorders, uh, Mental Disorders. So, um, so this is kind of why um, the LGBT older adult is super important. Um, another sort of area that we've been looking at heavily is in insurance coverage for gender transition related healthcare. Um, so a lot of plans, unfortunately, even after the Affordable Care Act was implemented by the Obama administration, um, there was a, a section of that, um, of that law called Section 1557, um, which prohibited discrimination against people based upon sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. But uh, the, this um, section of the law only applied to plans that received federal funding. So Medicaid, Medicare, um, plans on the health insurance marketplace, um, any private plan that takes federal funding. However, there are still a lot of what we call self-funded plans across the country and in New Jersey, um, and many of them still have these transgender exclusions written into them, and they're always buried very deep within the plans, so you have to look. And usually the wording is very sort of antiquated. It'll say like um, sex transformation surgery, sex change surgery, which is not language that you know, transgender people are comfortable with. Um, and um, this is actually, unfortunately, legal for them to do because they are taking on, these employers are taking on the cost of covering um, these plans themselves. Um, and they can therefore skirt these ACA regulations. And we've actually um, found that it's not just private employers that do this. We've actually found that um, there are a number of municipalities in New Jersey that do self-fund their insurance plans. Some of them do have coverage for transgender related care, um, but some of them still have exclusions and we have actually worked with, um, we've worked with a woman in East Orange who's been discriminated against and has not been able to get her gender confirmation surgery covered. And we've also worked with um, a woman in the township of Wayne who has been having issues with um, getting her um, gender transition related care covered. So it's still an issue and it's definitely something that we feel is more widespread than, um, and we feel like we're just kind of scratching the surface. Um, I also wanted to highlight that um, the New Jersey, uh, also uh, one more thing about the self-funded plans is that they are about 34% of the marketplace in New Jersey and they're growing. So it is a really huge chunk of the marketplace. Um, the New Jersey Department of Banking and Insurance, um, they decided to remove transgender exclusions earlier this year um, in accordance with the ACA regulations, but um, unfortunately they only sort of administer about 18% of the marketplace, so it's kind of a small sliver. Um, there was legislation on transgender related care that just passed the state, senate, and assembly, um, and it prohibits um, health insurers um, state health benefits plan, state employee health benefits plan, Medicaid, um, certain health care providers from discriminating against transgender people. But again, it doesn't apply to these self-funded plans. And it actually um, you know, has not been signed into law. And we don't really expect Governor Christie to sign it into law. But um, we are very um, happy that it did pass, because that bodes well for um, when you know, we have hopefully have um, a sympathetic governor who will sign it into law if we can get it passed again. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and that's, those are the bill numbers if you want to um, look them up. And um, if 
you do, um, ha if you have a friend, um, if, you, if you yourself have experienced uh, discrimination in healthcare, you can report it on our website at this link or you can call us um, at our office and we will um, do everything that we can to help. And if we can help, then we will link you to people who can help. Um, and I do also wanted to highlight um, HIV related policy because we're also trying to um, do more work um, around HIV advocacy in, in New Jersey because that is definitely still um, an, um, an LGBT health um, issue. Um, we do have um, laws in New Jersey that uh, criminalize HIV, unfortunately. Um, there are actually a lot of states that do, um, like in instances where people don't disclose their state status um, to a partner. Um, there have been cases where people have been prosecuted, have served prison time. So that's definitely something that we want to help address. Um, and then just in terms of prevention and care policy landscape, um, you know, we know that there are certain populations that are overrepresented in the HIV epidemic now, men who have sex with men, people of color, transgender women, um, intravenous drug users. Um, we know that pre-exposure prophylaxis um, is a tried and true proven biomedical prevention mechanism and um, um, the antiretroviral drug um, Truvada has been approved for usage um, for prevention. Um, but unfortunately, and New Jersey isn't alone in this, this is kind of across the board throughout the country, but um, many doctors are uneducated about it, they're uncomfortable prescribing it, and they subsequently um, are refusing to write prescriptions. I've been talking with, um, and we're trying to partner with, um, Hyacinth AIDS Foundation um, to sort of see how we can help them address this shortage of doctors who are willing to prescribe this medication because it really is life-saving in a lot of cases. Um, and then there have been reports of insurance companies refusing to cover it, not as much as the doctors just pr refusing to prescribe it. Um, some insurance companies will say that it's an experimental treatment or off-label use. Um, and then, of course, um, with the changes that are currently happening with the Affordable Care Act, the uncertainties around it, um, we know that people living with HIV are overrepresented in Medicaid-managed care. Um, New Jersey was a Medicaid expansion state, so a lot of folks living with HIV or at risk for HIV um, benefited greatly from Medicaid expansion, so um, we want to make sure that that um, is maintained in New Jersey if something happens at the national level. Um, and also wanted to flag, because this is related to LGBT older adult work, the population of people living with HIV is an aging population. So um, in 2013, it was estimated that about 25% of the people living with HIV are, were over the age of 55, and that's only going to increase as time goes on. And there are all kinds of sort of, um, you know, health issues and health concerns that need to be taken into account when treating um, people living with HIV um, who are also older adults. Um, so that's kind of like the end of my information about our programming. I also prepared a lot of information about sort of health issues on, of LGBT older adults in general, but I can stop here because I've been going on for about 15 minutes and I can take questions if you'd like. Um, so I will pause the, the, show, the show and uh, take questions. If anybody has any questions. Yes. Um, you mean like the, the replacement bill? Um, not that I know of. I think it's basically um, what, I've, what I've heard about the bill is that it is um, very much detrimental to Medicaid, that it would slash Medicaid, cut Medicaid across the board, and that, you know, if, if this were implemented, then Jersey would have to sort of, whoever was governor would have to, like, sort of pick up the slack, and they would have to find ways to, to cover what the federal government was unwilling to cover at that point. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think LGBT older adults would probably be overrepresented in that Medicaid population, especially LGBT older adults living with HIV for sure. So, I, 
I'm pretty sure it would be listed on, as a pre-existing condition in terms of the, the various versions of the health care bill that they were proposing. I mean, there like so many different you know, conditions were considered a pre-existing condition, like depression. Basically, being a woman was, like, considered a, a pre-existing condition. Being transgender was, like, you know, considered. So it wouldn't surprise me if HIV was on that list. I, yeah, it definitely doesn't just apply to LGBT people, but I just, I try to highlight it as a... LGBT and LGBT health issue, not the only one. Um, I think it's of particular concern just because um, in terms of the changes that are happening with the health care bill and the fact that so many people living with HIV um, are on Medicaid and that LGBT people are sort of overrepresented in that population, particularly um, transgender women of color, um, black gay and bisexual men are, you know, one in two black gay and bisexual men are at risk of becoming HIV positive. So the, all these statistics are very, very, like, disturbing to me, to me and to a lot of people doing this work. So that's kind of why um, I try my best to bring HIV back into the center of the conversation because I sometimes feel that um, organizations might push it to the side when I still think it's a relevant health issue. But I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not denying that, like, you know, um, non-LGBT people are at risk for it, especially, you know, if, if they are intravenous drug users, things like that. I think that that's still, um, that's definitely something that I, I think about as well. Well, but HIV is often associated with um, gay people, and gay people... Gay and bisexual, lesbian people are, um, when they go into a healthcare setting, the first thing that people often think about when they come in and they, you know, come out is, oh, they automatically sort of identify this population with sex. And then, you know, sex goes into HIV, STIs. So I think that, um, you know, I, I see where you're coming from, where you don't, like, where you think that... Um, you don't, I, I can see the argument of not wanting to automatically identify LGBT population with HIV, but I still think that it's a relevant health concern. It's not the only one, but it's something that I think, um, something that I think has lost, um, hasn't, not that, not that it's lost coverage, but I think people think that, um, that somehow the HIV epidemic is over in the United States, and it's not. Um, so that's why I bring it up. Um, well, sometimes, for one, um, often healthcare providers on their intake forms won't ask questions about sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. If you're not asking questions about a particular population to get more information about them, then you can't serve their needs well. Um, you just, I mean, and sometimes doctors will project a certain, um, certain lack of competency with a population in the way that their office appears, um, in the things that they say in, in an interview. Um, if, you know, for example, um, you know, a doctor asks unnecessary, unnecessarily invasive questions about a transgender person's anatomy, that's kind of an example of something that a doctor or a healthcare provider in general, because doctors are not the only providers, um, that would be an example of something that is ha that happens very often with this population. Well, um, I provide trainings to healthcare providers. Um, I will go into their offices and do a presentation like this one, except it's more clinical. Um, I will offer you know, guidance on asking questions about sexual orientation gender identity and expression on their intake forms. Um, 
I will offer guidance on you know how to integrate um, LGBT health concerns into a medical history form, things like that. Find um, other people as in partners. Well. There are a number of different places, I think. Um, you know, the internet has been really good in terms of linking people together. There are also some huge drawbacks to, to the internet. Um, I think there, you know, there are dating sites um, that people use to find one another. Um, there are community centers, although the community centers are starting to go under a little bit because of the internet. Um, and I think at one point, you know, a few decades ago, um, gay bars were huge, but even those are starting to like be less, um, I guess they're starting to go out of business and be less frequent in areas outside of like New York City and San Francisco um, because of the internet. Like people are just not using those as forums anymore. So I would say um, online is definitely where a lot of people meet. And maybe you know other, maybe other like non LGBT contexts too. Like people might just meet you know people at you know their place of worship or you know at grad school or college or what have you. So I think that there are a variety of places. It just depends. Um. Well, I think some doc some doctors and health other healthcare providers, nurse because nurse practitioners can you know write prescriptions too. So I don't want to leave them out. Um, I would say one lack of comfort with you know dealing with H HIV. There's a huge stigma um, still in healthcare um, related to HIV, and um, you know. And maybe it's not necessarily that they're not comfortable working with people who are at risk for HIV, which is pretty much everybody, but I mean, there are populations that are at particular risk. Um, but maybe they just like don't know much about the, the drug. Like, there are people who just don't know anything about it. Um, I think there was a survey done um, you know, a few years ago that just showed like abysmal rates of, of knowledge w among you know, medical practitioners about the medication in general. Um, and I think, you know, um, I think, yeah, and, and I think maybe there are still some healthcare providers who just don't want to work with LGBT people because they think that, you know, there's something wrong with LGBT people. So I would say those are a number of reasons that come to mind. Yeah, I mean, Phil Murphy, who we endorsed, um, has promised that he would sign anything that we wanted. So um, he um, wants to do the right thing, so we're happy about that. <laughs> well, actually, it's legal completely. Um, in every state, because the Supreme Court ruled the Supreme Court ruled that the bans um, at the state level were unconstitutional in 2015. Um, that doesn't always mean that there isn't pushback in the more conservative states. Um, but to answer your question about states where maybe there are higher populations of married LGBT couples, um, probably. I mean, this is a guess. I, I not really don't really know the stats very well, but probably like you know states like California, New York, um, Massachusetts, because they had it first, uh, or one of the first um, states that you know had same-sex marriage. So I would say one of those. And I think um, I mean in terms of New Jersey. Um, Asbury Park and sort of the surrounding areas um, have the highest concentration of like couples um, living together. Um, of course, uh, you know, not all LGBT people are in couples and not all people are married and everything, so um, that doesn't necessarily mean that 
Asbury Park has the highest population of LGBT people, so. So demography of LGBTQ older adults. So just some demographic characteristics of LGBTQ older adults. Est estimated that there are about one to two million LGBT older adults in the United States, and of course that's expected to grow. Um, and the da data is likely inaccurate because of the stigma that prevents people from identifying on surveys. Um, and and there, of course, LGBT older adults are as racially, ethnically, economically diverse as the general population, which is a no-brainer. Um, and then just, um, this is kind of, um, this um, history of stigmatization of LGBTQ identities is kind of hits at why LGBT older adults and LGBT people in general have, um, you know, these healthcare disparities and health issues. Um, this history of stigmatization, but especially, um, I wanted to sort of pinpoint um, people born between 1946 and, and 1964 or before 1946. Um, there was this real, like, especially. Um, huge like stigmatization of sexual and gender minorities. If you, you know, if you didn't live, you know, in a big city, it's probably not the best climate to, to live within. Um, I'm um, homosexual. Sorry, that should say homosexuality, not sexual orientation. Um, homosexuality was considered a mental illness until 1973, but it wasn't entirely removed from the the DSM um, of the American Psychiatric Association until 1987. Um, and then we didn't really see the first sort of societal changes and views on it, on homosexuality until the 1960s and 70s. In 1962, the first state decriminalized consensual homosexual sex, and the last laws were still around until 2003. And I think that was Texas. Um, and um, in terms of New Jersey specific laws, 1991 was when um, the New Jersey law against discrimination was um, amended to include sexual orientation. Um, and then in 2016, it was amended to include gender identity and expression. Um, in 2013, same-sex marriage was recognized in New Jersey. And then in 2015, of course, the Supreme Court ruling came down. Um, Gender identity disorder was not removed from the DSM until 2012. And the reason why this is important is um, for a very long time, um, transgender identity was considered a pathology and a disorder. Um, it was replaced with something called gender dysphoria, which there's still a lot of debate about whether or not that needs to be there, but um, it's definitely um, sort of a different definition in the sense that it characterizes gender dysphoria as distress um, experienced around gender discordance rather than characterizing transgender people as disordered. And gender discordance is um, um, the disconnect between the assigned sex at birth and one's gender identity. Um, and then I also wanted to pinpoint that there are still about 32 um, states that lack um, comprehensive LGBT anti-discrimination laws, um, including my home state of South Carolina. Um, so impact of stigma and prejudice. So um, of course, if you have the stigma um, attached to your identity, you're going to experience poor health um, because of this long-term concealment and this lifetime of discrimination. Um, LGBT people um, older adults especially are more likely to have experienced this discrimination in healthcare settings like I sort of talked about before. Um, they're less likely to be open about their sexuality or gender identity um, with their provider, which hinders the relationship with the provider. Um, there's a medical mistrust um, resulting in LGBT people, particularly um, lesbian women, um, not seeking preventative care. So there's actually been a lot of research showing that um, lesbian women do not get pap smears um, at the same rates that heterosexual women do. Um, and there's just a general sort of avoidance of health care until um, a crisis arises. So this is just some guidance um, about asking questions about um, sexual orientation and gender identity um, in terms of on intake forms. Um, and actually, um, to talk about legislation again, we actually did have a bill that went before both these, both the Assembly and the Senate. Um, I'm not sure of the exact status of that one, but we did have a bill um, that would mandate certain um, 
state health care agencies to collect this um, voluntarily reported sexual orientation and gender identity and expression data because of course you know there are going to be people who don't want to report it for whatever reason and you know we want to respect that but you know we also want to you know change the culture and say you know we need to be collecting this data and we need to be changing the culture and creating environments where people feel comfortable you know coming out to their doctors um, to their healthcare providers, et cetera. Um, and so, and the Fenway Institute is an LGBT healthcare provider and policy organization out of Boston, and they provide a lot of, actually a lot of the information in this PowerPoint is sort of adapted from um, their LGBT, uh, guide to LGBT health, and they just provide a lot of really excellent guidance on um, um, training around LGBTQ health issues. Um, and this data collection is recommended by the Institute of Medicine and the Joint Commission. Um, and it's important to stress to healthcare providers that the questions, um, you, need to be ta you need to be telling patients um, if they express reticence um, that the questions are asked of all patients. Um, and the questions need to be administered in a manner that's based on patient comfort. So. Um, you do need, uh, if, a pro if a provider does bring in these questions into, you know, a medical history form, they need to be asking it of everybody, not just LGBT people. Um, and these are just some um, pointers that the Fenway Guide offers about um, taking um, a sexual history specifically because that can be something that can be really, really uncomfortable for LGBT, older adults in particular. And these are just some sample um, data questions. And it's really good to have um, some fluidity in the questions. So if people don't, like, if people don't see uh, an answer choice that fits them, they can you know, have the ability to write something in. Or if they don't want to answer, they um, shouldn't have to answer either. Um, and then preferred name and, and gender pronouns is always a good question to ask. Um, and this is just a sample process of collecting the data. Um, I also wanted to flag something from a few slides back about gender dysphoria. Um, the gender dysphoria diagnosis and the DSM is very important because um, transgender people cannot undergo any sort of medical transition without receiving that diagnosis from a behavioral health care provider. So they can't start hormone replacement therapy. Um, they can't do any sort of surgical intervention without having um, that diagnosis. So that's kind of one of the reasons why um, people argue for having that in the DSM. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that while I was thinking about it. Um, conceptual frameworks for understanding LGBT health. So, um, and this kind of really applies to sort of healthcare in general, but just thinking about the fact that there are different healthcare needs throughout the life course. So younger people are going to have different healthcare needs from older adults. Um, social ecology, so understanding how somebody's social context influences their health. Um, minority stress, so um, in particular for, for LGBT people, um, this is sort of the experience of chronic stress that surrounds social stigmatization and this manifests itself in sort of external and internal processes. Um, and you know this can also apply um, to people of color seeking um, healthcare services as well if they don't feel um, that they're in you know a comfortable environment. So um, I think that it's important to realize that it doesn't just apply to LGBT people. Um, and then intersectionality. So LGBT people are, are not just LGBT people, but also coming from a you know a social, racial, ethnic, religious, economic, cultural and other factors that influence the way that they think about themselves and the way that they experience the world. So I'm kind of going to go through a little bit um, of the different sort of healthcare or health um, sort of needs or risks of LGBT older adults and things that need to be flagged. So with cardiovascular disease in older gay and bisexual men, um, we know that there's an increased rate of recreational drug use and cigarette smoking, um, and this is correlated with, um, you know, higher risk, of course, for cardiovascular disease. And the reason why the rates are increased is, of course, um, 
recreational drug use and cigarette smoking are often used as a coping mechanism for stress and social stigmatization. And studies have shown that smoking in combination with being HIV positive sort of greatly increases the risk of having cardiovascular disease. Um, and just um, to flag um, that it's important for um, healthcare providers when they're working with older gay and bisexual men to uh, obtain the age appropriate targets for blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes, just like you know, they would with any, any patient that they were working with. Um, cardiovascular risk in older lesbian and bisexual women. So cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women in general in the United States, so it's definitely should be flagged as a primary health care concern for um, lesbian and bisexual women. Um, and then, of course, um, prevention of CVD is, is as important as getting um, mammograms. Um, Studies have shown that 25% of women over the age of 65 have some sort of cardiovascular disease. Um, and then um, National Lesbian Healthcare Survey, which is referenced in the Fenway Guide, found that 30% um, of lesbian women smoke cigarettes in comparison with 25% of women generally. Um, obesity is another um, CVD risk factor. Um, and lesbian and bisexual women have on average higher body mass indexes um, in comparison to heterosexual women, so that's something that providers need to be thinking about, not to sort of stereotype people, but just to have in the back of their mind that this population um, has a disproportionate sort of um, risk for um, these sorts of health concerns. And then cardiovascular risk in transgender older adults. So there's been evidence of increased cigarette smoking in transgender populations, and that's related, again, to the stress and coping mechanism. Um, pharmacological use of hormones increases the risk of cardiovascular disease as well. So whether or not, um, so trans people can sometimes, um, sometimes they're getting their hormones um, outside of a, a healthcare provider's office. They might be getting them um, on the streets and injecting them that way, or they might be getting them from a healthcare provider, but either way, it, that does you know, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, exogenous estrogen, in particular, um, increases the risk um, of cardiovascular disease. Um, studies suggest that there's an increased risk um, for trans women um, taking feminizing hormones over time. And trans women, of course, um, is uh, male to female. Um, but there's no data to suggest that there's such um, a risk for trans, transgender men um, taking testosterone. And I also wanted to highlight while I'm thinking about this from other presentations that I've given that not all um, transgender people undergo a medical transition. So um, a very small percentage of, of people actually undergo hormone therapy and um, receive gender confirmation surgery. Um, this really is sort of tailored for people who do um, undergo. Um, the medical interventions, but there's sort of, um, you know, the three aspects of transitioning. We think about social transition, legal transition, and a medical transition, and um, not everybody undergoes all three. Some people only undergo one, and um, just because you don't go undergo all three, it doesn't make you any less legitimate, so I just wanted to flag that as well. Um, cancer risk. So, Anal cancer is um, actually a huge risk for um, men who have sex with men, um, particularly, um, um, and this is caused by um, infection with the human papillomavirus, which is the same virus that causes cervical cancer. Um, and when I saw these statistics, I was very sort of, it was very staggering to me that um, 72 to 90% of HIV positive people or HIV positive men who have sex with men are carriers of HPV, and then um, that HIV negative MSM, um, the prevalence was still about 50, 57 to 61 uh, percent. Um, and evidence does suggest that the incidence of, of anal cancer in HIV negative men who have sex with men approaches the levels of cervical cancer in women before um, the widespread usage of the pap smear to, um, to detect cervical cancer. Um, Risk factors for um, anal cancer include receptive anal intercourse, um, and if a um, if, uh, person in question is HIV positive, then the degree of immunosuppression is also um, 
is also a risk factor. And there are unfortunately not any specific guidelines that have been sort of instituted by the CDC for this, um, but some health organizations are suggesting an annual screening for HIV positive men who have sex with men, and um, a screening every two years for HIV negative men who have sex with men. Prostate cancer, there's no specific data on prostate cancer in gay and bisexual men. It is the second leading cause of death for men generally. Um, African American gay and bisexual men are at particular risk and this is linked to health access issues and medical mistrust. And I also wanted to flag um, that black men have some of the worst health outcomes of any demographic group in the United States and that's definitely related to health access issues and medical mistrust and certainly um, there could be a complete sort of separate PowerPoint presentation on that and how to address those disparities. Um, but in terms of risk factors for prostate cancer, um, high fat diet, um, family history of prostate cancer, um, gay and bisexual men are not necessarily more likely to, to develop prostate cancer, but prostate cancer can affect the sexual health of gay and bisexual men in different ways. So the prostate gland is involved in the sexual response to receptive anal intercourse and should be considered when discussing treatment options. Um, cervical cancer is another concern that maybe people aren't thinking about when working with LGBT older adults. I did mention earlier that lesbian women are much less likely to not, um, are much less likely to have pap smears um, and that's due to fear of discrimination, not disclosing um, sexual orientation. Um, the rate of, um, of uptake of, of pap smears and mammography usage has increased among lesbian women, but it still hasn't sort of um, hit the rate of heterosexual women. Um, and then, of course, lesbian and bisexual women still have a risk for cervical cancer because most have had um, penile vaginal intercourse at some point in their lives. Um, so it's important for them to be screened for that as well and for the sexual history to take that into account. Um, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends screening by cytology every three years for women ages 21 to 65. Um, the screening interval can be lengthened to every five years if a screening um, combines cytology and HPV testing. Um, and most women will discontinue this after 65 if they have three, neg uh, three consecutive negative um, pap smears. Um, breast cancer. Um, I don't... There, isn't, there aren't really any prospective studies that show um, elevated risk for, for lesbian women. Um, risk factors include um, age, family history, obesity, smoking, alcohol, um, nulliparity, not, not giving birth to children. Um, and of course, we, you know, I discussed earlier that um, older lesbians were um, less likely to receive, to, to rather seek out mammograms, um, and they also have higher rates of obesity and alcohol use. And of course, the current recommendation is a biannual mammography for women 50 to 74. Um, additional cancers that LGBT older adults um, need to be thinking about and providers need to be thinking about as well. Um, so lung cancer, of course, I was talking about the increased incidence of smoking. Um, ovarian cancer, nulliparity is a major risk fa factor, although it's important to remember that um, some lesbian and bisexual women have born children, um, so it's important to take that into account. Um, family history of ovarian and breast cancer can um, indicate um, a risk factor for ovarian cancer. Um, HIV-related cancers, um, Kaposi sarcoma, lymphoma, and other cancers are higher among HIV-positive older adults, and then if, um, older, uh, uh, other malignancies not associated with immune compromise um, can be seen in HIV positive older adults and are actually now the leading cause of death um, among H HIV positive older adults. Um, and liver cancers, um, gay and bisexual men have elevated risk of hepatitis B and C and this is of course through what we mentioned earlier, sub um, elevated usage of substances, uh, things of that nature. Cancer screenings for transgender older adults. Um, so as transgender patients age, um, they may encounter health issues that corresponded to the assigned sex at birth. Um, so for example, transgender, uh, transgender women, so this would be um, a person that was assigned male at birth, um, may need a prostate exam um, if 
the pro all of the prostate tissue was not removed um, through medical intervention. So um, they may be at risk for prostate cancer. Um, transgender men um, assigned female at birth uh, may still need a pelvic exam um, and may be, still be at risk for developing uterine cancer. Um, and there may, of course, there will be like additional stress related to coping with the, these conditions because, you know, people transition. So, you know, um, thinking about health concerns that were related to the assigned sex at birth could definitely produce um, additional stress as well. Um, hormone related cancers are rare, but there have been reports of breast cancer in, in transgender women. So that's an important thing to flag as well. Um, sexual health. So um, this is actually something that I feel is really important. Um, so HIV and STI prevention for LGBT older adults. I think a lot of times healthcare providers assume that um, older adults are not sexually active, which is not true. Um, so more than half of adults ages 65 to 75 reported being um, sexually active and 25% of adults ages 75 to 85 report being sexually active. Um, However, older adults are less likely to use condoms, less likely to have been tested for HIV and other STIs, um, and they report receiving very little information about sexual health, HIV infection, and um, other STIs from their healthcare providers because of all of these assumptions that are being made. Um, and as a result, there have been increasing rates of syphilis and chlamydia in older adults and in counties with um, high numbers of older adults and retirees. Um, so providers should be taking routine and thorough sexual and substance use histories, of course, with all their patients. Um, and they should be providing counseling on safer sex practices and when appropriate, they should be offering information about um, HIV prevention and resources um, if somebody has been exposed. So barriers to prevention, what we talked about, so lack of knowledge, um, underestimation of risk by healthcare providers. Sometimes there's a misdiagnosis, so Sometimes um, the symptoms, oh, at five minutes, okay. So uh, I'll stop in five minutes. So sometimes there can be um, a misdiagnosis. Symptoms of HIV can mimic um, normal aging or other medical conditions. So that's important to flag. Um, there's a stigma still associated um, with HIV, unfortunately. Um, HIV positive older adults might experience greater stigma from their peers um, due to this association that we talked about earlier of HIV with homosexuality and substance use. And then of course, hiding sexual behavior and sexual orientation from um, providers. Um, so since we only have about five minutes left, um, I might actually skip ahead um, because this is just sort of breaking down all the different subpopulations. Um, and some of it tends to repeat anyway. So um, I'll skip ahead to mental health, social, and economic issues. Um, just want to flag here that there's the well-documented link between mental illness and discrimination in LGBTQ populations. And there's still the discrimination present in all sort of spheres, um, especially in states that don't have good laws. Um, and we see elevated levels of current or lifetime depression in LGBT older adults, so that needs to be screened. Um, rates of depression are highest among transgender people. Um, and I think um, substance use tends to not be, um, the rates tend to be not that different. Um, it's still, of course, a coping mechanism that needs to be taken into account when a healthcare provider is talking with a patient. Um, concerns about aging, I think that um, younger gay men and older gay men feel that aging is sort of viewed very negatively among gay men, and that's sort of due to this influence of youth and physical attraction in gay male subculture. Um, however, lesbian women felt that aging was viewed a little more positively among lesbian women. Um, but in general, the concerns about aging among LGBT older adults can be similar. Um, loneliness, health, and income are, are huge concerns. Um, there are unique concerns of, um, such as fear of rejection, uncertain support, um, concerns of discrimination, things like that. Um, I'm going to just keep flying through here. Um, end of life issues for LGBT older adults. So. Um, 
It's pretty much the same for LGBT older adults and non-LGBT older adults, but we just need to get LGBT older adults talking about these things like um, palliative care um, and get healthcare professionals asking questions. Um, we need to get um, elder housing and long-term care facilities clinically and culturally competent to work with these populations. Um, we need to get LGBT community centers more um, holistically oriented rather than youth oriented. We need to get general older adult programming um, to be more inclusive. Um, I also wanted to flag that the Trump administration just recently rolled back a lot of data collection on LGBT people and LGBT older adults specifically. So the questions on sexual orientation and gender identity and expression were removed from a national survey about older adults and potentially could be removed from the upcoming census. Um, and these are some resources on LGBT aging for providers and patients. Um, advanced care planning, um, just need to be flagging this for LGBT older adults in terms of getting them to be thinking about advanced directives, living wills, healthcare powers of attorney. Um, and yeah, this presentation was adapted from the Fenway Guide to Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health. These are some recommended texts, and that's pretty much it. I hope that wasn't too dry and, and boring. I hope it was informative. Okay. <laughs>